you have a prepaid call from an inmate at California. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. To accept this call, say or dial 5 now. Thank you for using. What up, brother? How you doing? All right. So I, I kind of do stuff like that. I try to, um, like, involve myself in programs where I can, uh, like, tell my story. I was in a, it's not Fear Street. It was called Yap, Youth Adult Awareness Program. Uh-huh. Where they, they would bring at risk kids into the prison and we would tell our stories, you know what I mean, to try to help them out. So I'm down with that. Well, really, my intention for the penthouse was because of my lifestyle that I cultivated. So I grew up, you know, in a, in a bad environment with drugs and violence and stuff like that. And using drugs and alcohol, I cultivated those types of friends, right? So I've been incarcerated for 20 years. And over the years, since they were like fair weather friends, I've lost them all. And so the person I am now, I would like to cultivate new types of friends that could know me for who I am now, you know? So where do you go by? Um, I go by Alan. What's your nationality? I'm white. I'm, uh, my father's white, my mom's white, Mexican. Were you ever part of any gangs, prison gangs, yeah. groups or organizations? Yeah. I wasn't on Tango. Where you from out here in the streets? Uh, I lived in El Monte until I was 11, and then I moved to Sacramento. Okay, um, let's take this back to the beginning, bro. Like, like the beginning to where how you got involved in the gang lifestyle and what made you join the Nathaniels. Um, really, I was just um, a drug addict and a thief, right? And a bunch of me and my friends, we would smoke weed and drink beer and then I progressed into harder drugs like and stuff like that. And to support that habit, I began to steal. And that escalated. And, you know, as I got older, I ended up in, in prison. And in prison, it, the California has a prison gang culture. Um, when I came to prison, you were going to participate whether you liked it or not. You know, there was no uh, PC yards or SNY yards. There was nowhere to go and hide. You were on the yard, you know. There was nowhere to go. And you were going to be part of something, um, whether you liked it or not. And so that's basically how I became a tornado. What are you incarcerated for and how long is your sentence? I mean, I have 130 years to life for armed robbery and assault with a firearm. I robbed a drug dealer who happened to be a friend and a brother-in-law. So I robbed my sister's husband's brother. Okay, can you elaborate briefly on your case? I know the DA, the district attorney, have a certain narrative on your case, but can you, in your own words, can you elaborate what happened without incriminating yourself and others? And also, can you elaborate... Can you elaborate as well if, if you believe you got a fair trial and a fair sentence? Um, so I robbed a drug dealer, and in the commission of the robbery, while he was leaving, he started, like, he was somebody that I knew, he was a friend of mine. Usually we get drugs from our people that we know, and uh, I lured him to a house. I've already been convicted, I've been down 20 years, I lost my appeals. Um, I'm guilty of my crime, I'm responsible for my crime. Um, so when I kissed him with him and I robbed him, when he was leaving, he started talking shit. So I shot at him and I hit him in the ass. And he testified against me and I got, and they struck me out and they gave me eight life sentences. Um, my, I believe at that time, the person that I was, my sentence was fair. I absolutely deserved that. Because not only did I almost kill him, I almost killed his girlfriend. Um, we was in a residential neighborhood across the street. Right behind on the other side of his car was a family with kids. If I missed him, I could have hit one of those kids. So, and I was high on drugs. The person that I was, um, they needed to take me off the streets. That was my fourth conviction. And it was my fourth conviction for robberies, for assault with a deadly weapon, for using a gun, uh, for hurting people. So I absolutely had that coming. Okay, how... Um... Were you call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. 
How were you able to join the Nathaniel movement in the state penitentiary? Can you elaborate exactly where and how and how you climb up in the ranks and what your exactly was your position within that organization? Um, when I came into prison, when you come into R and R, there was a cop with a clipboard, and he would look at you if you were white or black or Mexican. He would ask you what your affiliation was, right? And there was at that time in Northern California, if you had a Northern California reception center, you was considered a Northern Mexican, right? That or a, a Mexican national, the plaintiff, right? And um, he asked me, he goes, you white or Mexican? I said, well, Mexican. And he just check marks Norteño. Just like that. Okay. And then, so once you get, when you get in there, and then you have a tag on your door, and everybody knows who you're affiliated with, and the homeless basically come and get at you. You're not like left wondering and waiting to see what's going to happen. Five minutes in your cell, somebody's going to come knocking at your door, introducing themselves, you know, and trying to um, basically wrangle you in. Were you part of uh, Nuestra Familia or, or Nuestra Raza or anything of that nature? Yeah, I was structured. I was. And can you uh, elaborate, if you will, on the rules and regulations of that organization? Oh, well, that was... So I've been out for a long time and I was only in for a minute. So I did, had been in prison for years and years and years. And I was always... You had a right to say no. So when they would try to recruit you, they would always look for willing people. And I was never really, like I said, I didn't gangbang on the streets. I wasn't, I wasn't a drug addict and a thief. Um, I didn't gangbang when I was a kid. I wasn't on the streets. I wasn't part of gangs. Um, I was always running from them, you know? So in there, when they was always trying to recruit me, I was always refusing. And my 30s, I caught a life sentence. And I was mad at the world, and I wanted to fight back. And so when they offered me a chance, that's the time I accepted it. Do you guys control any certain parts of the yard? For instance, the handboard court area, the workout area, or certain tables and things of that nature. And also, how do you establish that control in that area from other groups? Um, usually... It's by mutual understanding. So because you're willing to protect and defend it, the administration knows this. So they'll put, if there's four group segments, let's say there's whites, blacks, um, Mexican, which is the north and the south, and then others, they'll put five tables on the yard, right? Um, so they'll put five little tables on the yard with five little workout areas so that everybody can stay segregated, you know. Um, if there was four, let's say there's five group segments and there's four areas on the yard, somebody's going to end up fighting for an area, you know. And usually the dominant, uh, the dominant segment is going to uh, gain that area. Were you ever a validated gang member? Yes. Let me ask you this, bro. Um, how would they able to validate you? What proof and evidence did they have in order to validate you? Um, they have association. They use tattoos. Uh, got caught with a knife. So no, I take that back. I wasn't fully validated. Right before I got validated, I had got caught with a knife. And so my validation never went through. I had dropped out before I got validated. Okay, let me ask you this. As far as that organization is concerned, what would get an individual removed from the yard? Say that again? What would get a member removed from the yard? What violations would, would he have to violate in order to get removed from the yard? Um, there can be a host of things. It can be a personality conflict. Uh, somebody who had charge of the yard might not like you. They might ask you to do something and not appreciate your response. Like, you might get asked to remove somebody, you know what I mean? Uh, stab somebody, fight somebody, um, help pay a goat debt to 
somebody else or the host there should be a host of things. And usually it's the person that's in charge might not like you because all of a sudden now they have power. They want to flex that muscle. They need everybody to know, hey, I got power. So even when there's nothing going on, they find something to go on. Um, I've seen people re be removed on word of mouth. Somebody, hey, that guy's no good. And I, I vouch that he did this and that. And, and it can all be lies. And it's like, no, dude might have got uh, been intimidated by this person. And so now he has the keys to the yard. He wants to have them whacked. And that, that happens a lot. One of the things that will get you removed from the yard, right? So there's, there's a lot of things that we do. So you keep track of enemy movements and the police. You keep a roster. Um, you have paperwork that are called the bond, like the rules, household rules and bond. Uh, certain things are expected to abide by. And they want you to have a copy of this. If you get caught with this, you can get validated, right? And they consider that sketchy. So if I have paperwork that belongs to the household and the cops find it, I basically just pull. So everybody that has this keeps you hooped. And along with that, you have you hooping your paperwork, you hooping your knife, you hooping your you know what I mean? So that's another one of those things. If you get caught with a knife, that, that will get you removed because given a, a knife to the police, they look at that and it's like a PC move. You need to, the yard is dangerous. When you go to the hole, you're protected. You live in a cell with one person, you go to the yard in a cage with one person, there's no danger there, you know? And they look at you leaving the yard as you did it on purpose. So if you get caught with a knife, you get removed. You can't. During the process of uh, removing itself, what kind of in, how many individuals do they have to go assault these individuals? And also, do they come with knives and maybe have two or three individuals um, punching him? How does that work? It's usually a two-on-one. So usually, it depends on the yards. If you're on a four-yard, it's going to be two guys with knives, and they're going to, hey, man, let's go for a walk. And they're going to get you halfway around the track, and they're going to start stabbing you. And 10 or 20 feet behind you is there going to be a backup. By in case one of the dudes go down, the backup jumps in. But it's almost always a two-on-one. Okay, let me ask you this. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, brother, if you're not finished. And you, the orders are to keep stabbing until they start shooting. That's the order. So on a four yards, in yards like High Desert, Corcoran, and Pelican Bay, is what they want is they want you to kill him. They don't want you to stab him. They don't want you to beat him up. They don't want you to hurt him. The objective is to try to kill him. Right? So if you can stab him in the cut his throat, stab him in the head, or stab him in the heart, that's what they want you to do. Right? And, but usually the guys that they're sending to do this are afraid themselves. You know, they don't really want to do this but they want to be accepted, you know, because they have their own issues. And so they're, they're fighting out of fear themselves, and it don't usually happen like that. What happens if that individual that got assaulted for a removal survives a removal? Where would he go from there? Oh, uh, they go to PCS and Y yards. So usually they can't go, once you're a victim, you can't go back to the yard. And so CDC has these uh, policies in place where they take you and they protect you. And it's called, it's, well now they're called uh, sensitive needs yards, but back then they were called PC yards, protective custody. Okay, can you elaborate on what other organizations, prison gangs or groups that your organization do not get along with? So, so we have a hierarchy of enemies. And the first one is the police. The police is your number one enemy because the police is harassing you all the time, eating your cell, taking your shit, um, controlling everything that you do. After that, it would be uh, Serenos, so Southern Mexican. Um, after that, it would be whites because whites are aligned with Southern Mexicans. Um, and that's basically it. And you don't really have no alliances. You don't trust nobody. You don't. You don't even really trust the guys that you're with. 
you know, any, even your own homeboys that they know the most about you, they're the ones that can tell on you and set you up. And you never know if they're going to hit you. When you get stabbed, most of the time it's your homeboys that are going to stab you. Okay, have your organization green lighted any other organization? And if you guys did, what did you guys do to that organization? Um, no, I'm not aware of nothing like that. Not an organization. You just you just have enemies. You don't have. So I know that down south, um, whole cities or whole gangs and whole neighborhoods would be green lighted for not paying taxes and stuff like that. So we the uh, northerners don't do that. Okay, I heard from another northerner, you might be a different prison, I'm not sure, that, for example, that the Wolfpack skinheads got green-lighted. Are you aware of that, and if you are, can you elaborate on that? Well, all, well, all skinheads, well, all skinheads, well, first it was our Nazi lowlighters in the uh, 90s, in the late 90s, we had a, a green light on Nazi lowlighters, but because they were coming out of Pelican Bay with orders from from the brand and Emmy, and they were taken off on homeboys. And then after that, they removed the Northern Riders, they all got validated. And so the skinheads, we had green lights on skinheads. But those are basically, we were just basically taken off on like most white boys. Because usually the skinheads are militant, right? And they're uh, more structured and they're more powerful. And they're, um, they always want problems. They want to control their little aspect, their little areas and stuff like that. And so there's all you can't have two big dogs in the same yard. And so anytime they're around, they want to bark and growl and they want to fight. So that's where that starts to happen. Okay, have you ever been involved in a riot? And if so, who was this riot with, what group, and also what caused that riot? So I was in a 200-man riot with white boys, with whites and Southern Mexicans over a softball game. Because we were playing, uh, we were playing softball, and the way it goes is that when they call yard recall, whoever has the high score wins. And right when they called recall, it was we were up one run. The guy up to bat uh, was one of their best batters, and they had guys on second and third. And so as soon as they said recall. Instead of pitching the ball, we called game. And somebody started talking to us like, hey, man, that's fucked up. And somebody told me, you're fucked up. They told fuck you. And next thing you know, there was a big riot. Um, that was a 200-man riot. Um, there was a 30-man riot in a dorm. is because two of the littlest guys in there kept eyeballing each other. Um, they wanted to fight. And then, as soon as, soon as you have homies that want to fight, everybody's in. At DBI, there was riots every 90 days. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Yeah, that was two of the big ones. I was in a, a riot one time where the Northerners have, like you say, green lights on uh, Bulldogs. And they came, uh, when I was at DBI, they brought nine Bulldogs. And the Southerners uh, surrounded them to protect them. And the policy is that they have to go. And so we rushed a pile of Southerners to get the Bulldogs. Okay, let me ask you this. What made you step out of the organization and call it quits? So I had a... So everybody on a forehead, everybody has a knife. And if you're a northerner, you have an, everybody has a knife. The expect, expectation is that since we're outnumbered, you want to be armed, you want to have a weapon. And since I was, oh, I was clicked up, I was a gang member, I had a weapon, and that weapon, you have to secure that weapon, right? And so we, you put them in your ass, you hoop them, and what happened was it tore a hole in my battle, and I almost died. And so I went to the hospital and they cut me open and took it out. And I stayed in the hospital for three months um, trying to live. And then at that time, I had realized that the people who really cared about me were my family and the people that I thought that I considered family. You know what I mean? Like, all the guys in prison didn't care nothing about me. 
and it, it changed my priorities, and it made me not want to do that no more. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Okay, what do you have to say to the youngsters out here that's involved in gang activity? Say that again? What do, you ha what do you have to say to the youngsters out here that's involved in gang activity or thinking about joining gangs? Um, so I have a crowd of people around me that are making noise and I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I'm fine now. Can you hear me now? Uh, I, can, I can hear you, but I can't hear the question. Okay. What do you have to say to the youngsters out here that's involved in gang activity or thinking about joining gangs? This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Okay, I get it. I get the question. So, I think back when I was younger and all the times when I was faced with decisions, in my heart, in my head, I used to, I used to think, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And I let people encourage me and talk me into doing it. I never listened to my instinct. But you know what I mean? That first instinct, that, that thing that tells you, nah, that ain't right. Because when you know, you, we all know better. And I always do better, but I, I let people talk me into doing stuff. Or I talk myself into doing stuff. You know, and I think that you should listen to your first instinct. When you know something's wrong, don't do it. Don't let, don't let other people push you into doing things that you know ain't right. You have 60 seconds remaining. Okay, I don't have no any more questions for you, but do you have anything else to uh, address or add? Uh, no, not really, man. I'm, uh, I, hope I, I hope I can help something, you know. If it, if it helps somebody, if somebody hears it, and, yeah, I hope I, you know, I always want to try to help.